how y'all doing everybody this is jermaine from shovel nose hogs back with another video and i have some special guests for this video we have john rice and mitch davey from fathom hogs so i'm going to swing it over to them so they can further introduce themselves and uh discuss how they got into breeding and keeping hog nose snakes as well as how long they've been keeping um these snakes or been in this industry so we'll start off with john Hey guys, my name is John Rice. Uh, I'm one half of Fathom Hogs. I started keeping hognose snakes probably about eight years ago. Um, I got into them after boa constrictors. I used to keep boa constrictors when I was younger and uh, wanted to get to a smaller species that was easier to keep. Uh, large numbers of them in a similar area. So after bouncing off of maybe corn snakes and king snakes and different things like that, I really found that uh, hognose snakes were something that I really wanted to get into. I had kept them when I was younger, and I was really fascinated by them. They're just a unique species, and they're just amazing to work with. And I'm Ditch Mave. I got into hognose about seven years ago, and uh, I met John, and... We had a, an idea, a vision of creating new stuff that the market doesn't have. And we've just been pushing forward with all kinds of new stuff and new, new morphs for everybody to enjoy. And um, it's kind of where we're at right now. And, and yeah. All right. So where did the name Fathom Hogs come from? What does that mean? Well, that, that, that came from Mitch. Um, so... When we got together, he's like, hey, man, if we're going to start building a brand here, we really need to like think of a name for us. And so I left it up to him for a few days and he came back to me with uh, Fathom Hogs. It was like one of the first ones that we came up with. And at first I was like, dude, I don't know, man, that sounds that sounds weird to me. Uh, but uh, I'll give it a try, you know, whatever. And it really grew on me. So the reason we chose Fathom Hogs is we wanted people to uh, not, you know, to fathom what we right. wanted to do right. next, exactly. you know, so to, to really uh, just be blown away about the projects that we were uh, working on. So that's why we chose Fathom Hogs uh, for our brand name. Okay. And so you're one of the, I guess, few people in the hognose uh, community that are like business partners. So what are what are some of the pros and cons of being business partners uh, as, as well as y'all live in uh, separate states? Uh, yeah, no, uh, I think that helps. So it, it gives us two completely separate places that we can base our collections out of. So I'm uh, based out of central Ohio and Mitch is based out of southern Florida. So we have to keep our snakes in two completely uh, different ways, just because mostly uh, the, the climate here in South Florida is very harsh compared to uh, other parts of the country. It's warm all the time. They don't really have a wintering period, which these hog nose snakes really benefit from. So, but uh, the benefits of having a business partner is, man, you can really lean on each other. You know, me and Mitch, I know a lot of people out there have gotten to know us very well. Uh, we're two different personalities for sure. I'm uh, the calm, collected one, and sometimes he can be the the, the muscle of the group for sure. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's we built not only a uh, a beautiful business, but a, a great friendship as well. Um, and I think that's one thing that we've taken away from this that we both value. Okay. Yeah. So I can touch a little bit on some of the other stuff too. The questions you just asked too. I don't know if you want to just. Yeah, you can. You know, edit them or whatever. But yeah, Fathom Hogs came from, you know, my experience that I told you earlier about people mimicking me, mocking me, asking me like, what do you think that's going to look like? And I, I was always thinking about the new next thing that nobody was doing. Everybody was stuck on snows and snow condos and snow supers. And and uh, we were thinking forward like, hey, check this out. We could do this, this and this with these jeans and nobody's even done it. And I was like, so when I thought of the name, I was like, well, 
you know, let's think of something pretty good. So I, I was like, fathom, man, nobody can fathom what we are doing, you know, because most people are stuck on the stuff that's already there. And like I told you earlier, um, most people don't see the end game and they are stuck until they see the end product. And um, John and I are, are different in that retrospect is we joined together as a team because he had stuff that nobody had. I had stuff that nobody had. And we're like, bro, we had the same idea. Like let's create a bunch of that nobody's got and make some new cool stuff to bring to the market and show people what the possibilities are. You know, they can't even fathom it. So um, that's where Fathom Hogs came from. And yeah, John was a little skeptical at first, but um, yeah, no, it really stuck as far as the meaning and, and what it, what it stands for. And, um, the pros and cons to meeting people online and, and starting a business with, well, John and I kind of hit it off and we have more than one passion together. Um, not just the snakes, but cannabis. And we both are storming forward in both directions. And I was, you know, when we partnered up, it was kind of reluctant at first. I'm, I'm sure John was a little weary. I was a little weary. Like we never met before. And we met at Daytona and I come up with these shirts ideas and, and uh, some business cards. And he's like, let's get it, dude. Let's go out and hand out business cards and let people know that we're coming. And uh, we did. And yeah, it's, it works out good because we're two total opposites. I'm what they say, eccentric, you know, <laughs> more like adjective, weird Webster dictionary. Um, but, you know, it works out good because I have high energy, John, not that John doesn't have low energy. We're just complete opposites. He's more grounded and more um, conservative. And I'm more like outlandish and eccentric, as you would call it, or weird. And uh, it works out good because we're just complete opposites. And so, yeah, it, it, it kind of works out. Not kind of. It works out really good. But as far as business partners online and stuff, I don't know if I would, you know, like, encourage it but i would definitely tell people there's benefits to it because if something goes wrong at your house like john was saying like it's two totally different climates if something goes wrong at your house then at least your partner's got your back got the project at his house and then you guys could bounce back from that and move forward and and that's that's one of the really good benefits of you know being in a partnership and not having the whole collection in one area because you know you can't control electricity or you know, things when you're not home, um, you know, there's just tons of stuff that could go wrong with your setup or whatever life in general, you know, so uh, it makes it really like a, a huge benefit to have our collection split up and working forward and he can work on stuff and I can work on stuff and then we can bring it together and, and make it like one cool project. So there's a lot of benefits to being partners. I, there's probably some negatives too, but I'm not really trying to focus on those. And nope. I would just say, yeah, it's there's a lot of pros to being with somebody who's like-minded. And you know, the only thing I would say is just know who you're dealing with and get to know them on a personal level and meet up with them. Don't just assume everybody is, um, you know, good or great or whatever. You know, due diligence. Don't just partner up with Joe Schmo that you talk to on private message, but you know, you meet up, talk to each other in person and you guys have common interests. And yeah, I don't, I don't see it being a negative thing having a business partner in this community as far as, you know, moving forward with stuff. Okay. And so uh, transitioning to the, the next question, um, both of y'all work with a ton of different morphs, whether it be incomplete dominant or recessives. So just kind of, um, Tell us what are some of the, the, the genes that you are more um, known for or the ones that you prefer to work with the most? Uh, we'll start with uh, John. Well, I mean, I really, really enjoy Arctic. Um, Jeff Gale Wood from JMG Reptiles produced that a few years back. And the super Arctics were just always something that I thought was an incredible animal. Uh, I really like black and white animals. Uh, and the contrast on those, especially after they shed, are just amazing. But uh, piggybacking off that, another uh, gene that I really enjoy is sable. Um, sable is just like the best improver gene that is really out there. So 
you know, you add it to uh, albino, you add it to toffee, you add it to exanthic. I mean, even uh, Arctic and super Arctic, uh, some of these uh, new super Arctic sables that, you know, we've made this last year really look like uh, incredible storm clouds, which are, you know, the exanthic sables. So it's something that uh, I'm just real passionate about in those genes uh, in particular, something that, you know, the, the future holds as well. Um, I really like the Swiss chocolates. I think they'll probably always be overshadowed just because Sable was here first. And they're so uh, they're so similar, uh, but different at the same time. Um, but, yeah, I just really like I just really like those the Arctic and the Sable gene in particular. OK, what about you, Mitch? Uh, I'm a huge fan of lemon ghost and uh, pastel pink albino. So I've started a couple of projects um, that we're working with, uh, with those two genes and also the permafrost stuff, of course, um, but mostly the pink pastel and the lemon ghost. Uh, there's just genes that I saw that were not really highly sought after in the beginning. And a lot of people didn't really recognize the potential in the animals. And I started projects that nobody was really doing, like the Arctic Het pink pastels and, and making the galaxy and all that. Um, I just saw more potential in it. And I just didn't understand why so, so many people were overlooking it. And so I decided to go that route, you know, the less traveled route. Um, and yeah, we've created a lot of cool stuff um, with the pink pastel, not just the galaxy, but the sunset stuff, sunset condas, sunset super condas, and that's with Sable too. So um, we partnered up with Daniel on that one to make the heads uh, originally. And uh, yeah, it came to fruition a couple of years after. Um, but yeah, those are the two genes that I really like following and working with and stuff like that. Okay. And have either one of you uh, produced maybe a world's first uh, combination or even introduced like a new gene into the hobby? Yeah. Um, we, we haven't introduced any new genes yet. We have some things that we are working on that are potential new genes that are uh, um, kind of being hush hush about, but uh, they're there. I've, I've talked with some friends about them. And uh, they're very interesting thus far. We're just trying to prove those out now. But um, world's first, yeah, we've we've created quite a few. I know on on my front, we've done uh, the Arctic Sable Conda, or uh, we also coined it the BBC. Um, we've uh, we've done the Red Rocket, which is the albino version there. So that's an Arctic Conda sunburst. Um, we've done super Arctic, uh, Mai Tais. We've done super Arctic Conda Mai Tais. Uh, Dan actually this, sh this last year produced some, uh, super Arctic, super Conda Mai Tais that were from, uh, animals that I'd given him a couple years back. You know, there's a, there's a, a lot of really cool, interesting world's first that we've done, um, as well. I mean, we've done the super Arctic, uh, sables. We weren't the first, but we were one of the first. I think Gail would beat us to those by a, a couple months. But, you know, we're, we're never in a hurry. I think that's one thing that's uh, with us is we stay in our own lane. It's not like we're, we have to make worlds first. It just kind of happens that way. We like to take these rare animals and rare genes that we have and mix them in with uh, the, the other genes and just see what happens. Uh, especially in the Mai Tai. I think, uh, you know, the super Arctic Mai Tai, who knew it was going to be purple? You know, it, it's it's just an amazing animal. And, you know, the Conda version is even better. Uh, you know, it's, it's you just don't know until you do it, just how these genes are going to react with each other. So, yeah, that's, that's some of the ones that I've done there. All right. What about you, Mitch? Any world's first or close to world's first? I've done one or two. Um, back in two, 2017, I hatched out uh, the first Sable Hypo, which we uh, called the Oxide. Um, and that was the start to many more. And we, um, I didn't get the permafrost, even though I'm known for permafrost. I, uh, James Douglas got the first permafrost, but I think I told you earlier I was a week behind on that. And um, 
Then we had the Galaxy, which is the super arctic pastel pink albino, and then the Sunsets, which I've hatched out every single one of them. And the funny part was I hatched out the Super Conda version of the Sable pastel pink albino first, and it was like, well, I would like to see what the regular one looks like, and I got to see that like a couple of years following. But the first year I hatched out the con- the Super Conda and the Conda version pastel pink. And what, is there any more? Can't, am I forgetting? I can't think of anything. I mean, we have a lot of animals that are very unique as far as uh, just the genes they're carrying, um, but they're not expressing them yet. So we, we've got some really interesting projects moving forward. Yeah. Okay. So now I want to go into um, kind of breeding hognose snakes for maybe the beginner or somebody that's maybe have bred, but they don't really um, have everything down packed. So we're going to start with like the the size of what do you think is the most appropriate size for an adult female and a male? And what is the most appropriate age to start breeding them? Um, You go ahead, John. You know, uh, that's a that's a wonderful question, you know, and it can go f- from many different perspectives. But for me, I've always taken my time. I like my females to be at least uh, three years old and I keep them in a 32 quart uh, Sterilite tub. I like keeping them in a bigger tub like that because they can move around. And I feel like it helps out a lot with being able to have an egg box in there um, as well as having some regular bedding and it just gives them room to move around. I think it helps with, uh, egg binding. Um, I haven't really had any egg binding, uh, in the past few years since I've done that. And for males, I like keeping adult males in 15 quarts. Um, ARS makes a nice rack as well. I think it's what the, the 20 series rack I think that's what it is. It's a uh, it's a wonderful tub for males as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's a, a ten sixty five. No? Yeah, it's a ten. Yeah, maybe it's a ten series. Yeah, it's a ten series tub. Uh, they're a, they're a wonderful wonderful tub for raise ups and adult males as well. Um, but yeah, that's the size of tubs I keep them in. But I think the most important thing uh, for these guys is really brumation and light cycle. Yeah. Um, brumation is always key, especially with the males. So what I've what I've seen in uh, in the past is if I don't brumate my males long enough, I have infertile clutches. Um, so I like to brumate my males for ten weeks. I like I like them to hit in the upper thirties uh, for for a little while. I know some people don't go that far. I know Mitch goes to about fifty degrees down here in South Florida, but um, for me, up in up in Ohio, I am blessed with seasons. And during the winter time, I just unplug everything and cover up my windows, let it get nice and dark, so their uh, light cycles minimal at best. And I let them get very cold. So I, I they have dipped uh, below freezing point a few times out in my snake uh, room, snake building, but. Uh, the water dishes freeze. Yeah, too, I've right? had the water dishes freeze a couple times. But what's nice about Ohio is I can keep them in the same cage. So literally the entire room is cooled. I do that with my babies as well. Um, I really feel like it makes them better breeders in the future. They go through that uh, cycling every year. And I don't see any difference in size difference with ones that we keep out. Um, when we wake them up, it's this is just a theory, but uh, it makes sense biologically. When the babies come out of brumation, they really turn on as far as feeding goes. So it's something that it's a chemical that's probably released in their brain that says, hey, it's time to eat and grow. So if we have some uh, hatchlings that don't thrive right off the get, we usually put them into brumation uh, that year and it helps them out dramatically. Um, we, we can really get them storming forward in the spring when we wake them up. And the most important thing for those little guys is just keeping them hydrated at that point. So we keep them hydrated going into the fall and then uh, use, use usually like a cocoa core. What's the longest you've had a hatchling go without eating? Um, probably five months. I've had a, I've had a hatchling not eat anything. 
I just kept them hydrated and, uh, and that's about it. Just yeah. focus on hydration. I've had one go for yeah. 14 months. Yeah. Yeah. And then it turned on. It's one of my breeder females now. And yeah, what a great snake, but yeah, you just never know. And they can make it a very long, long, long time. As long as you keep them hydrated and electrolytes and, you know, food isn't really the main thing. It's just the husbandry and the habitat in which you're keeping them. If temperatures are correct, the snake feels comfortable. And yeah, so, I mean, we've had hatchlings that hatch and it's unreal. Like seven, nine months. And then all of a sudden they turn on in their machine. So um, these snakes are very so, so Mitch, how is your rumation process different than John's since you live in South Florida? Oh, dude, mine's completely different. Like, I can't follow John on advice, and not because he's giving poor advice, but because we're on different latitudes. And honestly, I just picked this up this last year, like, because of the other adventures we're on, I'm paying more attention to light cycles and stuff as such. and. Yeah, John's life cycles are different than mine. He's in Ohio. I'm in South Florida. We're basically so close to the equator. We have 12 on 12 year round, and that depicts winter for most animals. So um, you need life cycles. Like he said, they're just crucial uh, to these well-being of these animals. They need at least 16 hour plus life cycles if you're going to be, you know, keeping them in a cage or whatever you keep them in and keep them consistent on eating. They, they can pay attention to barometric pressures and everything. Um, they're pretty, pretty intellectual, even though most people coin them as derpy or like kind of, you know, slow or whatever, but they're not They're There's just a different species entirely as far as the way they interact with food and the way they go out and home. So a good book that, that helped us understand and helped me get my collection right years ago, because when I first started, I failed miserably for almost three years. I listened to advice from other people that I thought were reputable and whatnot, but their advice didn't work for me. And um, I read this book called by Dwight Platt that John put me on to. It's called the natural history of Western and Eastern hognose. And it's not anybody's opinion on keeping hognose. It's, field collected data these guys go out into like kansas wyoming south dakota north dakota and they collect hog nose and then put trackers on them and track them and then understand everything from homing like how far they go out every day away from where they call home and all the way down to gut content to morphology to breeding to like everything about hog nose western and eastern and once i read that I truly understood better like how I should be keeping them because I'm here in Florida. I have to keep them in an AC climate with heat and give them a nice range of, you know, higher 70s to low 80s for them to thrive. Our humidity is thicker. And like I said, our life cycles are like 12 on 12 year round. And that snake thinks winter, winter, winter. So unless you have a supplemental lighting on, like a timer or whatever, um, or unless you live higher up on on the um, latitude longitude, um, and you can have the animal just have to go off light cycles outside of the room. But if you're south, you need to depict the light cycles yourself because a lot of people will say, "Oh, well, my husbandry's right, my temperatures are correct, everything's great," but the snake's not eating. Well, maybe the the light cycle is depicting something like winter's coming or whatever because that's what they're perceptive to. It. So for me, I have to brumate my hogs in wine coolers and I have to, I bring them to like 50, 55 degrees and I'm very careful at what, what, the way I do it. I don't really open the fridge because of condensation and humidity in the air. Um, you can give upper respiratory infections if you open the fridge constantly and constantly checking on them. And um, I put them in the fridge for about two months, but I, sl I slow them on their feeding. I pull them off of heat for like, three weeks prior to putting them in the fridge. So, and then I, when I pull them out of the fridge, I don't put them on direct heat. I let them come to room temperature and then I apply the heat slowly. So it's like gradual. Everything's different about my place. John doesn't have to use heat. He uses the ambient temperatures 
and he can do that. The hogs are totally okay with his room stays at what temperatures they that they need because those are the temperature ranges in which they live in. Uh, down here in Florida, it's so hot. If you had hog nose and ambient temperatures, you'd smoke them. Uh, they don't really like heat. People think they do, but they don't. Um, too much heat, and you can just smoke the animal very fast. You just build bad bacteria inside the animal, and they just go downhill quick. So everything's different for us down here in Florida. Well, like I said, from everything from ruminating into fridges where he can just open up his windows, I have to move my snakes into other containers, which I'm sure is stressful, and then put them into um, a fridge which I'm sure is not that great, but that's the only way I can depict winter and, and guarantee the fertility of my males because, like John said, he likes to get them cold. I can't do that with the fridges because of the condensation and stuff. They'll, it, they'll freeze, actually. So it's not the same as, like, an ambient room temperature of, like, 34 degrees. It's different in a fridge because it's sucking everything out. Um, so you can't go that low with the wine coolers. Uh, I've learned that lesson the very hard way, and uh, I hate to admit it, but yeah, I've, I've froze a couple of snakes listening to people saying they have to go below 40 or four, around 40, and, and that's not it for people in the South. Uh, 50, 55 degrees, and that's enough, and I black out the front of them. Like John said, close the light cycles, so I put sheets over top of the wine coolers, and uh, two months, three months in total between cleaning them out and then pulling them off the heat, and then um, the two months in brumation and then the, about three weeks acclimating them back to heat. So about a little over three months total in brumation, but life cycles are key when you pull them out. You can't just put them out into like the life cycles that are outside because it's still too short of life cycles. So there's a lot of things to pay attention to, especially being down in the South. It's, it's kind of its own beast. And a few of the other um, breeders will tell you, They'll say, we can only confer with each other. We can't call anybody north of Florida, and that's just what it is, you know. But that's that's the animal, you know. And that's why it's good to partner up with somebody and keep your collections in two different areas because it's a lot. It's different. Okay. And I remember um, when I spoke with you in Daytona, you were kind of going over, like, your – your um, protocols to prepare your snakes for brumation. And you mentioned something that I've never heard anybody else do. And you deworm your hognose snakes as well as give yeah. them vitamins before. So kind of explain that and um, why you do that. And when did, and when did you start doing that? So John actually is responsible for this whole thing. He's one who put me onto it. He, you know, we started deworming our stuff. Well, I, after I learned from him that, you know, the mice carry parasites and uh, everything you feed these animals, they, you know, like mice and, and if you have to use toads or whatever, if you have Easterns or whatever, they carry parasites. And no matter if you're buying from, a, 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 you know, any of these reputable places that you buy rodents from, no matter how reputable they are, they still carry parasites and they're not parasites active, they're dormant. They're inside the rodents. They're born with it. Like dogs are born with worms. You got to deworm them. Mice are born with worms and other other parasites that you are not really um, aware of. And they become active. Like, for example, people feed their snakes mice and they wonder how they get poop flies or fruit flies in their snake room. And they're like, well, I don't have any windows open. I don't understand. Well, check it out. You feed your snake mice. The snake eats the mouse and there's parasites inside the belly of the mouse that are dormant. As soon as they hit the heat inside the snake on the heat tape or whatever the heat source is, uh, they become active. And then next thing you know, you got maggots in the poop when the snake poops out the, the, um, the poop or the fecal matter or whatever. And then all of a sudden those transform into flies and then they're flying around the room and landing in poop and laying more uh, larvae and eggs and all that stuff and the process is really quick so like your room can become contaminated with flies they're not harmful to anything they're not harming the snakes or anything of the sort on a large scale but before they go into brumation you know you're not feeding them as much and there's less for the parasites to feed on inside the snake so like in turn it can make a harder winter on the animal so we 
go deworm the animals and hit them with anti-parasites and anti-bacterial uh, stuff just before they go into brumation to assure that it's not a poor experience for the animal because when these animals shut down, a parasite will take it take over and and like like people think like oh my snake's healthy you know I feed them this these mice from this place and I'm good they're they're nice mice whatever but there there's parasites regardless so we go through that protocol to ensure like that you know basically the success of our next season so and and also the success of the animal as well that we can continue breeding this animal and can carry on and move forward. So it's a protocol that we go through before we put them into brumation to ensure um, the well-being and the success to come. So, okay, yeah, in particular, uh, you know, pinworms as well. That's something that is uh, just like Mitch said; they're dormant inside of the mice, and we can eliminate those with uses of the deworming medication and that can really keep the weight on our snakes. So we don't, I don't overfeed my snakes a ton. I mean, I feed my adult females uh, once a week, once every 10 days uh, routinely throughout the year before, uh, you know, egg production and things like that. I do bump that up. I do smaller meals more often, but uh, you know th that's what's important. And if you have uh, worms uh, or any other type of parasite inside your snakes, they're eating that food, you know, and they're eating that nutrients that your females are trying to uh, trying to use uh, to be able to make eggs. So it's something that you know we're very passionate about taking care of. So yes, yes, it's hard for the animals to put the weight back on as well if, if they do have parasites like that. So it's nice to eliminate those. And the things that we use, you know, we use a uh, panicure. Sorry, panicure is one that we use. It covers uh, some some spectrum of the the, the worms. And then we also use Proziquantel, which covers the other spectrum of all the parasites. And then uh, something that I really like is if you can get it, liquid batril does really good orally. Um, and then uh, also Thailand. So Thailand is a very interesting dewormer uh, or, or antibacterial. It actually can't, uh, covers gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. It's used for pigs. So you can get it at uh, uh, your local TSC, uh, just like our, just like our uh, dewormer that we use. Panicure yeah. right here. It's wonderful. I grabbed everything, Jermaine, so yes. we could show people what we use. It's goat dewormer from uh, from Tractor TSC. Supply. Yeah, tra Tractor Supply Company. This stuff right here is perfect for animals uh, or the animals that we use uh, these on. So, is it like a powder or like how do you? Liquid. So this is all liquid, and now uh, and we dose the. Uh, I wouldn't do this instruction. People. Yeah, that's probably know. a good idea. Research. I would say research a uh, a veterinarian and give their get their suggestions on dosing uh, for that yeah, stuff. We just don't want to be held accountable yeah. for people dosing their animals. Yeah, incorrectly. Yeah. Incorrectly. incorrectly. Because we've heard of people in the past that gotten advice from other people. As that has nothing to do with us, but other friends of ours that have gotten dosing instructions from another breeder and then smoked their whole collection. So we're not going to give dosing instructions. You'll have to reach out to a, 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 licensed, you know, a vet. licensed veterinarian and get dosing instructions. We'll give you the, the medications that we use, but I, we just can't be held accountable for people, you know, misdosing their snakes and stuff like that. Okay. So here's another medication that we use. It's called ceftazidime. It's an intramuscular um, antibiotic, and we use it for uh, bulb tails, um, upper respiratory infections. Uh, sometimes I use it for like snakes that are like not putting weight back on uh, after breeding and stuff of the such. Um, trying to think of what else I would use it for. Mostly just. Yeah. So this is the only one that, you know, we do intramuscularly. So the rest of them are all done orally. Yeah. 
yeah, we, we don't uh, inject, especially Bay Trail, uh, into, into animals. You can really have a, a negative effect on the area, the injection site. And it can actually cause renal failure as well. So it's something that you got to be very careful with. Like, that's why you should uh, ask your vet on dosing there. Okay. All right. So now that um, you have your hognose snakes um, in, in brumation and they're coming out of brumation, what is your protocols on terms of when do you start feeding your females and males and then when do you start pairing them? So for me, I, I bring them out of brumation. So I do a slow warm up since I'm up in Ohio and in my facility, it's all concrete enamel floors. So it takes a little while for the room to actually warm up. Everything's really cold and it takes about a week or two to get to the temperatures that I desire. Um, in the wild, like I said, uh, Mitch read the paper by Dwight D. Plot, the, the natural history of nat uh, heterodon nasicus and platyrhinus. It's a wonderful paper. It kind of makes you throw any husbandry that people tell you about clubrids out the window. Um, I bring them up nice and slow and, and get them to, you know, the, the, the mid 60s. And I introduce males right away. Um, it's not something that I say, hey, I need to start, uh, start feeding females before I introduce males or anything like that. I introduce them right, right away within the first few days, bring them out of brumation. So in the wild, you know, these guys aren't waiting for the spring spring weather to, to start breeding. Uh, usually they're coming out of hibernation or brumation and they're going straight out. And it's it's game time for these guys. So so they want to start producing uh, eggs as early as possible to give the babies the best chance of survival before they have to go into brumation. So it's uh, it, it's for me, I introduce right away. And the breeding activity from the males. So it's real slow at first, obviously, but the breeding activity from the males actually stimulates the females to start uh, to start ovulating and breeding themselves. So usually with ovulation comes a want for food. So these guys have breeding activity going on and they just want to start pounding food. So usually within the first 10 days out of brumation, I'm, I have done offered food, and I would say about 60% have fed uh, at that time. And usually after the next week to 10 days, the rest of them have fed from there. So I just keep them at a, a room temperature of about 70 to 73 degrees, no belly heat, no nothing. Um, the most important thing to me is the 16 hours of daylight. So they go from zero daylight. Uh, during brumation to 16 hours. That's mimicking the longest part of the days uh, of the year. So it really influences them on uh, the breeding just from the drastic amount of light that comes in from when they were uh, in brumation before and then the slow warm up of the room. So it, that's what's been most successful for me. Okay. And uh, I was watching your, you, one of your Instagram lives and you did something pretty unique that I thought of. Mm -hmm. And I, one of your pairings, uh, you took the, the male and the female out of their, like their, their normal container and put them in a separate container with like paper towel. Is there mm -hmm. a particular reason you do that? And do you do that with all your pairings? Um, sometimes that's something that I, I have done in the past, uh, especially with, uh, smaller males so the reason i did that is when they breed they actually get some of the sani chips that i use i use sani chips some people use shaved aspen and things like that um but i use sani chips and it actually can get stuck to the hemipene of the snake so, so in the shade stuff yeah too. so that's the reason why i would bring them out and i use uh just butcher's paper uh, as a substrate with a water bowl and a height bowl, and I, I breed them on there. And as soon as I've got a couple su successful locks, I throw them back on sandy chips. But this year, I bred straight on sandy chips and had zero issues. So, but it's something that I have had issues in the past. Usually, if I have a unique animal, like the only one in the world or something like that, I'm very cautious on how that male will breed in case he gets an infected hemipene and we have to have that, you know, this works takes to a bed. Mm -hmm. This stuff right here. 
not not everybody will be able to get be, be able to get this stuff their hands on it but if you can it's magic and especially if you got a male that pulled a piece of um, bedding or whatever it may be back inside and he's got a infection of some kind um, you can usually get the, the the item out of there pretty easily by prolapsing the hemp bean. Uh, but if you can't, even still, this will help treat any infection that comes with that. And um, I do it a little differently than John. I use the large shaved aspen only because the suppliers don't ship over to here or I don't buy enough to have them ship it. Um, so I use the shaved aspen from like your local pet store. And I've only had like one or maybe two incidences where they were pulled a, a chunk of that into the um, vent, but it was hanging out luckily because they're so big and I was able to pull it back out and treat it with antibiotics and the animals rebounded quick. But here's the paper that John's talking about the book of um, the natural history of Western and Eastern hognose by Dwight Flatt. And it gives a, a pretty good contents table of contents of everything from um, methods, description of description of study area, morphology, uh, fossil record, ge geographic range and habitat, temperature, and that temperature is very important. So that helped me reproduction, food habits, population, the whole nine. So I do things a little differently than John. John. John will wait and grow females up to 300 plus grams before he decides to breed them. Um, in this paper right here, if you read it, it'll t it'll sh it'll show you females breeding in the wild, um, 100 grams or less, and it's not depicted upon age. It's depicted upon, I mean, it's not depicted upon size. It's depicted upon age. So you'll Correct. have in the wild females that are three and four years old that are barely 100 grams. And they have in, in this field study um, incidences where, and I'm not advocating anybody to breed anything under uh, 220 grams. That's my protocol. That's what I get them to. But in this study, it talks about um, the size of the females that they're finding gravid and everything in the wild and how they uh, operate in the wild. And in the wild, they don't really get over 200 plus grams. That's only in the hobby. Um, so. It's, I try to take verbatim for this stuff and rely on the natural the natural way of the Western hognose and the Easterns as well. But I do I do things a little bit differently than John. And I, I understand why John does the way the things he does because he wants to ensure that the animal is not going to be egg bound or anything of the sort. Because if you breed small females, you can run into that issue. Um, so it is wise to wait till like at least 220, I would say. Um, but yeah, I would refer to this natural history of Western hognose snakes as like almost Bible. Um, it's great information. And I was also going to say that the, the snakes don't really stay, uh, get above like 75 degrees throughout most of the year. And you'll see they do, um, temperatures of the, of the soil in which they're found in and where they're found at and the depth where they're found at and these animals don't really see heat unless they're digesting food or whatever they come up at, at certain times of the day to eat and and, and uh operate and they, it'll really be very brief when they come up and and reach those temperatures so it's a very fossorial species they're not meant to climb trees sure they see them in uh, low-lying bushes and things like that, but not up in trees. And uh, they really find them around, you know, vernal pools, uh, especially in the spring to eat frogs and toads and uh, fish. Uh, the, the, you know, that's something that, you know, these guys really like that people don't really think about. They love fish. Um, it, it's, it's something that, you know, if we have to trick a baby into getting to eat a pinky, we use fish most of the time. So... It's uh, it, it's interesting how it works. This, this paper, like I said, it uh, it's it was from the University of Kansas, and it really just makes you throw the rest of your husbandry out the window that people tell you about, and 
it really makes you want to look at things like, all right, where is this animal from? And, and what is the climate like where this animal is? Okay. All right. And so now that you've had a successful pairing and you have your females laying eggs, um, how do you incubate your eggs and at what temperatures? So I incubate all my eggs in, uh, in moist cocoa core. Um, I incubate them at 80 degrees and it comes in at about 55, 60 days usually. What's interesting with that is that, uh, you know, the, the gene sable, uh, it is from Montana, which is in the northernmost uh, range yeah. of the northernmost range yeah, of uh, right. the hognose snakes. Uh, they do go into uh, southern Canada as well. But these guys coming from that climate up there probably roommate about half the year. And uh, it takes about a week off the yeah. amount of days that the eggs have to incubate. So that's what I incubate mine in. I incubate them just in little uh, throwaway food containers, meal prep, uh, meal prep containers. Yeah. yeah. And uh, just put some cocoa core in there, bury the eggs. So the top of the egg is just buried, like not covered, but just buried. And the reason I do that is because any condensation that forms on the top of that, uh, that container inside the incubator that drips on top of the egg, it can give you problems. I'm not saying it will, but it can. And it's just like having a sponge on top of uh on top of those eggs in case that happens and it can really absorb that water that drops onto the eggs what kind of cocoa core are you using i'm using uh just simple bricks from a hydroponic store you can get them online it's going to be fine cocoa core it's not going to be like the the chunks of cocoa core like uh, a lot of all python breeders use it i don't know what it's called it's like a repta bark or something like mm -hmm. that i don't use something like that i use something that's very fine and been processed into a brick and then just expand it from there. What about you, Mitch? I use, um, so I used to use vermiculite in the beginning, but I realized that with the vermiculite, you can contaminate the, um, the medium and you can get mold and mildew, which will pretty much kill off anything live inside your egg. that will basically suffocate it. Um, so I've switched over to uh, cocoa coir as well, but I use a horticulture of cocoa coir it's made by fox farm and it's already comes hydrated and i've found that i don't have to add any moisture to to it it already comes already fluffed out in a bag and uh it works good it does the whole 55 to 60 plus days and there's actually a little bit of moisture on the bottom uh, when it's fully done it might look dry to the top but at the bottom there's a a small bit of moisture that's left and um yeah i i find it goes the whole way but i do put little two ounce little cups of water in there just to be safe and i use the same um, meal prep containers john does as well it, it just makes good for space and they work well for a lot of things like nest boxes um incubation and um also uh, brumation for smaller like nails and such as well. So like they get multiple uses out of them and you can get them at Walmart or you can buy them on Amazon. They're cheap. It's like 10, 10 pieces or whatever for like nine ninety nine or something of the such. But yeah, it's very inexpensive and, and easily um, used for multiple purposes. And what degrees do you incubate the temperature? I incubate at 81. And that's pretty much standard. You probably get about like mm, 58 to 65 days um, and they start to hatch. But yeah, about 81 is where I stay. And so now we're going to uh, transition into just showing a few of the hognose snakes that y'all produce. And some of them y'all already uh, mentioned earlier in the video, but I'm going to put them on screen. And I just want y'all to kind of go through basically the history of, of how you um, got into the project and just kind of discuss the, the different genetics that are involved. So the first, one I'm gonna bring up, the first one I'm gonna bring up is this permafrost uh, from you, Mitch. So kind of explain where, where you from. Got this from Facebook. <laughs> We're waiting for it to upload. I got it. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a nice one. 
it's not the best example, but yeah, no, I like that one. All right. So what, what is a permafrost? What are the genes that are involved? Permafrost is a triple visual, uh, sable, caramel, hypo. And how did you get into this project? So I got into this project years ago. Uh, there was a guy named John Mickles. John Mickles. Yeah, that, that's what his name was. I'm sorry. Brain fart. John Mickles happened to start a bunch of projects when Sables had first come out. And he bred a Sable to a bunch of different things, a, a Frost being one, Albino being another, a, a Snow being another one, and Toffee, and uh, pretty much went down the line. And I had just gotten into Sables, and I was like, <clears throat> this guy was selling all his collection. And I, and I was like, well, that's kind of crazy. This, this, These are genetically potential of a lot of different stuff. And i John and I went ahead and purchased, I would say, a good part of his collection being double hat everything, basically, Sable Lavender, Sable Snow, Sable Toffee, and, and a bunch of different um, other double and triple heads. And that's how I got the original ones. And I was like, dude, this guy is crazy for selling all this potentially, you know, new, cool new morphs. And, um, so we purchased everything and then I raised up these animals and we bred them the triple head to triple head. And I think it was like one in 64 and we, we hit one, but we hit one after James Douglas who produced the first one. And it was just a, 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 a crazy looking animal. I didn't even know what it was. Even the frost that were produced, we were like very, we didn't know what we had. Uh, we were just very mind blown at, just like how weird these animals looked. And um, we were very confused for a little while at what we actually had because of the, all the genes that were at play. Um, but that's how the permafrost had originally started. We had purchased somebody else's collection that, I don't know, for whatever reason, didn't see the potential in the future. And uh, we were like, gladly, well, we'll take that. Uh, and yeah, a lot. That's how the oxide was produced, the permafrost and toasted caramels as well, and um, was all through this gentleman's stuff. Um, and then we obviously broke off and went other directions as well. But that's how that that came to be. Okay. And so I'm about to post another snake, and this one is going to be for John. And this is a snake that I got off of your Instagram account that you produced this year. And it is the Super Arctic Sunburst. So, okay, I started this project, started a long time ago. I've, this is a fifth generation animal. So, I, I started albino arctics back in the day and everything like that so i have two uh wonderful female albino arctics that i bred a sable conda to and the sable conda was 100 percent het toffee as well so that's what made the parents there so i bred those together and made some normal appearing arctic condas that were carrying the gene for albino, sable, and uh, and fifty percent heifer toffee. So that's that's where those these what all came from. It? So then I that was for the female side. I I raised up females for there. I do have males as well, but I I'm very big on outcrossing. I don't inbreed animals. Don't do anything like that. I try to keep genes and lines mm -hmm. as far apart from each other as they can, but still being able to finish out a project. So on the male side, I took a sunburst male and bred it to a bub's daddy female, which is a super Arctic conda albino to be able to make uh, triple A's albino Arctic anacondas 100% at Sable. So that was the pairing that I did to make these. Um, and I did well with them. I, I made uh, super Arctic sunbursts. I made Super Arctic Conda Sunbursts. I made Super Arctic Sables, 100% head albino. Super Arctic Conda Sables, 100% head albino. Just a wide array of, uh, of wonderful snakes with this one. Okay. 
All right, and so the next snake will be for Mitch. And we kind of, we talked about this uh, earlier on the phone and Which you mentioned one? it earlier and it's going to be the galaxy. So kind of oh. explain what, what, what genes are in play here and how you got started with this project. I'm looking at my phone, it's so slow. It's just like loading. <laughs> um, yeah, so like I told you earlier that the pink pastel gene was just very undervalued and a lot of people were um, undervaluing it because the original version had uh, neurological issues, but it's such a gorgeous snake. I mean, they, they a single gene one looks like a coral, a purple haze, um, some of these double visual animals, and it's one single gene. And I was like, I don't understand why something is so undervalued. I, I get the neurological issues, but that could be bred out. So uh, I, I acquired my pink pastel collection uh, from Johnny Black a long time ago. And I saw a lot of potential with this, with this uh, gene that everybody either really liked or didn't like. And it was like, there was no gray area. So I, I uh, quickly was like, well, there's no super Arctic pink pastel and there's no Arctic stuff um, with pink pastel. And uh, I decided to take that uh, pink pastel conda and breed it to some of my Arctic stuff. And um, he turned out to be 100% head albino, like regular albino. And so we had like an electric project, which was pretty cool. And um, I ended up producing the, the first one, I think, uh, two years ago. And um, yeah, I was just very mind blown with, with the result and uh, very pleased. Um, that a lot of people really couldn't see past, you know, what could be done with the animal except stuck on the negative. Um, but yeah, the, okay. the galaxy turned out to be really cool. I kind of wanted to go with the same theme as uh, Jeff Jr. with the uh, lavender uh, super Arctic, which is the moonstone. And I was like, well, let's just keep it in space. And uh, it was, it's really different in person that I could never really capture its true colors. It's pink and purple. And, and it was just like, what well, remind me of like a, a galaxy picture online if you looked up some space, like a galaxy in space or whatever. So I, I kind of went with that. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a cool combination. We have more stuff to come with that. Our end game is the, the sunset, which is the sable um, pastel pink, which we um, created a couple, two or three years ago. Uh, we plan to do them in Super Arctic. So stay tuned. We have some cool new stuff coming up, but it's going to be a little bit. All right. And so now I'm going to bring up the last picture. And this one is going to be for John. And this is the Super Arctic Mai Tai. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool animal. Um, so this project started quite a few years ago. I had the same male that I worked with uh, Sunburst stuff, and I bred it to a arctic toffee female so when i bred the male to uh the female i didn't know he was het toffee he was possible at low chance so it was a, a sable conda that i bred to an arctic toffee at that point just to make double heads and uh from there i the first hatchling to come out was a toffee belly so I immediately know, knew that he was carrying the gene for toffee as well. And the last egg to at hatch was a Arctic toffee conda, which would therefore be 100% at sable. So that's where my mail came from for this project. Uh, later on uh, down the road, I had made with uh, collaboration with Jeff Gale Wood double het females and also another visual arctic toffee conda het sable so that's where this one came from about three years ago we made the female uh for this project the male was made about four years ago and this year it came to fruition uh, all females were 
I have two females. One is an Arctic Toffee Conda Hat Sable, and the other one is an Arctic Conda Double Hat. And I bred the male to both of them. And uh, in the Arctic Toffee Conda, I got this one. Um, just a wonderful animal. We didn't know really that it was going to be purple like this. Um, Jeff Galewood had a lot of insight on this as well, though, since he had made some super Arctic toffees that he said when they hatch have a purplish hue to them. But the sable uh, came in and really delivered a really nice purple animal. So that's how this one came along. Okay. Yeah, it's really interesting that it's purple. I yes. wasn't sure if it kept that color as it started shedding out. Yes, it, it has yeah. so far. So it's shed now. Um, this will be its third time it's just in shed currently. So I can get you some updated pics of it. Um, you know, probably within the next week or so. And it it is just an amazing animal. Even amazing. The Arctic toffees are purple with like a orangish background the mai tais yeah i mean yeah the, the arctic mai tais sorry. yes yes all right and so um i know you mentioned um earlier mitch that one of your future projects that you're focused on is the the super arctic uh, sunset are there any other projects that you're looking forward to this next coming season or like in the next three years that you want to um oh, let yeah. us know about there's a lot of projects. So we got full transparency. Uh, a lot of uh, of the permafrost stuff will come to fruition in the next year or two. We'll have uh, hopefully permafrost condos and permafrost um, super condos and arctics and super arctics. So that stuff's in the works and um, definitely uh, lemon ghost stuff. We're planning on making like true 100% lemon ghost super arctics and super arctic condos. And then we also plan to incorporate it in our sable double visual stuff. Um, lemon ghost, uh, Mai Tais, lemon ghost, um, sunbursts and sunsets. And yeah, just to enhance the colors that are already there. Um, it base colors matter. So like we talked about earlier, um, base colors matter with all these morphs um they could look one way online and and if the person doesn't have the base colors they're not going to make it look the way it looks you know online or whatever because you know reds and purples and lemon ghosts and all these line bread traits they really enhance the actual recessive traits so we have we have quite a few things coming up uh in the works as and storm cloud stuff as well too so a lot, a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I probably could sit here and name up of five or six new projects that we're hoping to bring to fruition in the next year or two years. Okay. And um, what about this year? What was, I guess, your most anticipated project that you've already hashed out this year? <laughs> you, can start, you can start with, uh, you can start with Mitch. Yeah, it's funny you ask that. Um, Oh, let me get connected with you real quick, Jermaine. I don't know if, if you can see me. I can, or not. I can hear you. You can hear me. Um, this year, I kind of had a, a, a crap year, um, to be 100% honest. Um, a, a lot of stuff didn't really come to fruition as I would have liked to do that, uh, as I would like to. Um, so I kind of dropped the ball myself. I just I took on a lot of uh, new business this year and stuff, and I didn't have the diligence and the um, attention to detail basically this last year. So uh, I didn't get to bring some of my stuff that I would have liked to bring to fruition this last year. Um, kind of just waited for this next year to come and didn't really breed all, everything that I had. Um, but this last year I, I produced some more oxides, which was cool. Um, and push the Lemon Ghost project stuff forward as well um, to make the Super Arctic Lemon Ghost and Super Arctic Super Conda Lemon Ghost stuff. Um, I think John really took it this year, to be honest with you. He he really killed it, to be honest. He, he, he made all kinds of really unique that, like, we've been waiting a long time to, to show to everybody because, like John said, he, he doesn't just breed it. The, you know, he could get the stuff to adult size in a year, two years flat, but he really takes the time. And this year, 
stuff he should have bred last year because I'm always arguing with him about get it out there, get it done. But he's like, no, nah, next year they'll, they'll do us work. Um, and this year he really took it home, to be honest, for the team. Uh, as far as for our dick summers, sorry, we have dogs that protect our snakes. So anybody that thinks they're swervy, you know, Obi will meet you. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> uh, but no, John really took it uh, and hit it out of the park this year with the Super Arctic Sunburst, Super Arctic Honda Sunburst, Super Arctic Super Honda Sunburst, and the Mai Tai Arctics, Mai Tai Super Arctics, Mai Tai Arctic Hondas. I mean, we haven't even gotten a chance to name these things appropriately because he's just killing it. I mean, I don't know what else to say. He really uh, carried us this year, to be honest. Um, but next year, I plan to be back on track and with uh, a lot of new stuff coming forward. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Y'all definitely produce some one of a kind animals. So to kind of uh, wrap this interview up, if somebody wanted to purchase a hognose snake from either one of you guys, where can they find uh, you, or where can they contact you? Um, you can you can really get us on Morph Market. Uh, we 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 keep some of our animals on there. We've recently been posting on Fauna Classifieds as well. Uh, I know Mitch does some stuff on Facebook, but you can also reach directly out to us on uh, on Instagram. So uh, Shovel Nose eighty two on Instagram and Adam Hogs LLC. All right. And uh, did y'all have any questions for me? Yeah, we we were kind of just <laughs> wondering. Where you came up with your name? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a good question. So, I've only been uh, into hognose snakes for like a year and a half, and so once I decided I wanted to start breeding hognose snakes, I was like, okay, I need to come up with a business name because I wanted to do a YouTube channel and uh, Instagram, and I was like, I want to choose a business name that kind of focuses on hognose snakes. So I had one business name called. Uh, morph chasers but i was like eh, that's kind of broad and um i was just watching like youtube videos the very few youtube videos they had on um hog nose and i saw one person mention that hog nose snakes use their nose to shovel dirt and i was like shovel nose hog nose i was like that that seems like a pretty good name but i was like you know what i bet somebody already took that name so i googled it shovel nose hog notes and i didn't see anything and then I went on Morph Market and you can go to like Western Hognose and go to the store. And I typed in, I went to the S's. I didn't see anything that says shovel nose, hog nose or shovel nose hogs. <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know what? I'm about to take this name. So I started my uh, created email, started my YouTube channel. And about five videos in, I was on Facebook and I saw somebody mention John shovel nose 82. <laughs> And I was like, man, that's pretty close to my name. And, um, yeah, and I looked, and I, I looked, I looked you up, and I saw you had all this sable stuff. Like I, I, I saw, I was like, man, you, you've been doing this for a while, and I was like, you know what? I think in the future it's gonna be pretty confusing. Uh, people are gonna confuse us. <laughs> and I remember um, not this Daytona, but the Daytona before. I don't even know if y'all remember. I came up yeah, to your table and I was like, oh, my yeah, name is Jermaine. Good. I just started a YouTube channel. Is it okay if I can film some of your snakes? Yeah. And I was like, what's your name? And I was like, uh, Shovel Nose Hogs. He was like, I'm, she was like, you're the Shovel Nose guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were like, I'm Shovel Nose 82. And I was like, wow, that's, that's crazy. I remember seeing you on Facebook. And yeah. And so, um, like I said, I was like, if I would have knew about you before, I, I probably I would definitely would have changed my name. Um, it's been a few instances where people have like um, sent me a message on Instagram. Um, and I'm like, you're probably thinking about John. It's shovel nose 82. And I just sent him right over to you. <laughs> hey, it's vice versa. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Hey, I get all the time. I love your YouTube videos. <laughs> and I'm like, wrong guy. <laughs> so, so, hey. Touche, man. It's cool. I'm I'm good with it. So yeah, uh, it, yeah. you. no, it's it, it, hard time. Hey, we can we can do this together. This is all about these snakes and uh, things like that. So from shovel nose to shovel nose eighty two, you know, we're we're just gonna do our thing out here. So you know, I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you bringing us on. 
Um, we got lots of exciting stuff coming down the, down the roads. Like uh, Mitch said, we have a lot of storm cloud stuff coming out this next year. We're breeding a uh, storm cloud to a uh, sunset conda. We've already bred storm clouds to uh, super arctic uh, lavenders. Um, so we're really trying to improve that gene since uh, super arctic, what it did to Mai Tai. We really want to see what it does to uh, storm cloud and lavender at the same time. So uh, we're trying to make a true blue hog nose snake with that. <laughs> and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see how all that stuff goes. And so I appreciate y'all for uh, coming on this uh, channel and uh, you y'all were requested a lot. So I knew I had to get y'all on just to pick your That's brains. Good. Yep. A lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people have a lot of fans um, and I've heard nothing but good things about both of y'all in terms of people that bought your snakes. Are you, sure you didn't just hear about John and his good charisma and, and how everybody loves him. <laughs> Uh, they, both of y'all they they love y'all okay 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 no i'm just playing thank you very much yeah thanks for